NYU, ואני הייתי סטודנט ב-NYU, ובזמן קיץ הלכתי לו לירושלים, והוא היה שופט. This was the year that he was on sabbatical, after he ran for president and lost. Um, his loss was my game because they exiled him to NYU. And I was a lonely student at NYU looking for somebody to learn with, and he was somebody to learn with. I really had never heard of him. Um, and he had never heard of me, that was for sure. Um, and we uh, started to do Dafyomi together in the mornings in the, in the library. And uh, I was privileged to learn with him. And in the summer, he took me around in Israel. And um, a few times we sat in this room, which hasn't changed in uh, many, 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 many years. When I came in here, I remembered uh, what it looked like, and it wasn't uh, so different. Maybe there were fewer books. Maybe there weren't. Um, I'm going to speak today on what should be the role of both governmental and private rabbinical courts in a liberal Western democracy. And what I'm really doing here is I'm going to compare and contrast my experience in America um, with um, my sense of what's going on in Israel and uh, perhaps reflect a little bit on the ups and the downs of private rabbinical courts, um, uh, seeing how things run in, in liberal Western democracies, and maybe you can help me compare to how things run here. I have um, a lot of experience in America. I've sat on hundreds of rabbinical court matters. I was the director of the Beth of America, and I was the guy in the Beth of America. And I have some experience here in Israel. I sat once or twice in Haifa under the direction of Rav Shari a long time ago. But, um, but my experience in Israel is much more uh, limited. I still sometimes interact because the rabbinical courts in Israel touch us in America with some regularity. But, um, but the system is very different. And I want to compare and contrast private rabbinical courts with state-sponsored rabbinical courts. And I guess I want to describe to you the way things work in America. So maybe you can understand how different things are. There are um, many private rabbinical courts in America. Um, there are some very large ones and some smaller ones. Um, but they are essentially contractual in nature. What do I mean by that? Um, they have no mandatory jurisdiction, with but one exception, which I'll come to later on. Um, but parties agree to go to private rabbinical courts all the time. There are, I suspect, as many commercial law cases in the rabbinical courts in America as there are in Israel. Many, many, many cases, uh, 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 continuous flow of cases. Why do people go to rabbinical courts? This is very important to understand. There are three reasons why people go to private rabbinical courts in the United States. The first is they believe in halacha, meaning some cases involve people who genuinely believe in halacha, and they're interested in doing what the rabbis tell them to do. My guess is, is that that's about a third of the cases, no more. Another third is made up of people who can't be in secular court because what they're doing is illegal. Uh, countless times I've sat on Dine Torah um, in which the underlining activity entails violations of secular law. So when you and I are in a business that does not pay taxes, not it's tax exempt, it's supposed to pay taxes, but it does not pay taxes, um, in that situation I cannot sue you. I cannot sue you in secular court because we cannot discuss what we're doing on the record in a public courtroom. Never mind more interesting cases that you encounter in uh, Baytin, like, for example, you and I are in the business of stealing cars, and we have a disagreement about um, how to divide up the money that we earn stealing cars. There's lots and lots of cases in the rabbinical courts that involve people who cannot have a public discussion of what they're doing. 
and they have to go to arbitration. And once they have to go to arbitration, they might as well go to a bacon rather than to anything else. But Bishul Mofin, in no way can they go to a secular court because you simply can't talk about how to divide up the proceeds of, uh, of our business that steals cars or even our pizza business uh, in which we're dividing up the pizza business good or agu in the language of the Gemara, buy or sell among partners when the business doesn't pay taxes, the business is half under the table, um, which is very common in the, rest, in the restaurant business. The restaurant business in the United States, nobody reports all their income, not just the Jews. Nobody reports all the income in the restaurant business, but it's hard to divide up the value of the business when our business earns $100,000 a year, 60 above and 40 below. We have no choice but to go to arbitration somewhere for both religious Jews. We might as well go um, to Beitin. And the third reason people go to Beitin is because they want a remedy that a secular court cannot give them. There are certain remedies that you can't get in secular court. What's the most important? A get. Sometimes the remedy that you want is a get. And a secular court simply will not, other than in the state of New York, order the giving of a get. And even in the state of New York, everybody's a little bit afraid for constitutional reasons what will happen if somebody vigorously challenges an order by the state. But an arbitration tribunal makes religious orders. And by the way, not only a get. I sat on countless bate din in which I've ordered one side to apologize. I've ordered one side to apologize. A secular court can't order you to or sign a public apology. Violates in America free speech matters. Um, all sorts of other orders um, I, I've given in a rabbinical court. I've turned to husbands and said, you must leave the girlfriend that you're living with. The secular court can't do that. There's lots of things that you can get done in private arbitration that you can't get done in a secular court. Private arbitration has, at some level, much, much, much more authority because it's not really bound by what we call in the United States procedural due process. We'll come to that later. But don't miss how important this is. The power that a Diane has in a Bacon is, at some level, greater than the power a civil, secular court judge has in secular court. It's true, the secular court judge can hold you in contempt, and that's a powerful authority, but there's lots of things that he can't order you to do, like apologize, or cease your sexual misconduct, or issue a religious divorce, or all sorts of other things. Whereas uh, uh, in a rabbinical court, you get all sorts of remedies. So how does arbitration law work functionally in the United States, and what do the Dayanim do? It's very important to understand. Arbitration starts in the United States not because the civil jurisdiction says go to Beitin. It starts because the parties sign a star Beirun, a contract of arbitration in which they agree um, to go to arbitration. And the standard arbitration agreement frequently says as follows, every single right that you have in secular court that you can waive, you waive. And if you say, I don't want to sign that agreement, I wish to keep some rights, what does the Bacon say? Not over here. Not over here. They say, then we're not going to hear the case. Well, then we're not going to hear the case. We insist that you waive a variety of rights. Now, the best of America doesn't insist that you waive all your rights. Um, but nonetheless, they insist that you waive some rights. They insist that you waive some rights. And if you step into a more Haredi community, they insist that you waive even more rights. So you frequently waive enormous rights. There is a secular arbitration law that governs it. It comes from a federal statute called the Federal Arbitration Statute. And here's what the Federal Arbitration Statute says. It says there's no limitation on the law that an arbitration panel can apply. Arbitrators only have to obey procedural due process, 
but not substantive due process. So when you agree to go to arbitration, forget about Jewish arbitration, you agree to go to union labor arbitration in the United States. The union labor arbitrator does not apply American law. When you're a football player in the NFL, those of you who follow the single most important thing in the world, the single most important thing in the world is the National Football League. This is very important. It's been an extremely important business in America. Know that the star quarterback was accused of cheating in football. And he was brought in front of a National Football League arbitration panel. Who headed the panel? An employee of the owners. Who was very biased and found against him. And he had sued in federal court, and the United States Court of Appeals from the Second Circuit, Guido Calabrese is here, that's where he sits, said, no problem. He agreed to be heard by a biased panel. Since he agreed to be heard by a biased panel, he agreed. That's no problem. And so even though there is some procedural due process, there is not any substantive due process. There is some fraud prevention. So that, for example, I can't pay the judge $50 or $500 or $5 million to throw the case my way. But the judge can be biased if I agree to a biased judge. Um, and there's not a lot of procedural protections. More or less, the procedural protections fall into five minimal categories. There has to be notice. We can't just hold a hearing at the last minute. You can't hold a hearing on certain days. Like you can't say we're holding hearings on Christmas, Le Machal, because Christmas is a federal holiday. And you can't have hearings on Christmas. You can't start hearings except during the business day. You can't say you must come to an arbitration hearing. It will start Saturday night at 3 in the morning. But the procedural protections are mostly procedural. Um, you can't say we're conducting our hearing in Portuguese. Oh, you don't speak Portuguese? Too bad. Can't do that. You can't require that a party waive their right to have an attorney. Can't do that. Um, you can't require that the parties waive their right to cross-examination. But when you ask, can the parties agree to be judged by Jewish law? even though Jewish law says something totally different than American law on any given topic? The answer is, of course. And not only can you agree to be judged by Jewish law, you can agree to be judged by almost any legal system you want, and you can agree to be judged by no legal system. I sat in many secular arbitrations in which the arbitrators agree that in which the parties agree that the arbitrator will decide this by whatever legal rule he thinks is appropriate. What, the, what we call kindergarten justice. Meaning I get to pick the law. Countless times I've sat with no appeal on what the law is. I make up the law as I go along. I live in Georgia, but I don't apply Georgia law. And I don't have to apply Alabama law. And there's a famous case in which the parties agreed to apply the Uniform Commercial Code, which is the standard commercial code in the United States, except the following chapters. And the court said, no problem. And I joked to my arbitration law students that a party could agree to arbitration in which the law that applies is the Uniform Commercial Code with every fifth word deleted. And if you would be foolish enough to sign something like that, the arbitrator will be foolish enough to apply it. It's so important to understand that what happens in the United States is um, no substantive due process. You don't have any right to have American law applied to you. Parties specifically go to Bate Din because they wish to be adjudicated according to halakha. Now, you might ask the following question. Can the secular court review to determine if the Dayanim have gotten the halacha right? But maybe the Dayanim have gotten the halacha wrong. And what's the answer? Heck no. Of course not. The standard arbitration agreement that I use says 
Um, this matter shall be determined by Jewish law as understood by Michael Broyd. So when you tell me the Shulchan Aruch says something different, I smile nicely and say, what? Gee, that's interesting. But the arbitration agreement gives me the authority to decide what Jewish law is. So even when I don't say the law is whatever I want, the law is whatever I want. And if you look at the Bethden of America website, the Bethden of America website says something a little bit sweeter. It says the Bethden of America shall hear cases in accordance of, with Jewish law as determined by the Bethden of America, which is no different than as determined by Michael Broyd. So when you go to civil court and say they got Jewish law wrong, here's six experts who will tell you what Jewish law really is. The judge says, I'm so sorry. I can't review what Jewish law is, not because it's a church-state problem, but because the arbitration agreement is written to prevent this. This is very different, by the way, than if I sign an arbitration agreement which says I agree to be adjudicated by Israeli law. If I sign an arbitration agreement which says I agree to be adjudicated by Israeli law, a judge in the state of New York will bring in experts to determine if I got Israeli law right. But if I write Jewish law as determined by the Beth Din of America, there's no review of this. So your choice of law provision is almost infinite. And it totally eliminates substantive judicial review. I've had about 150 of my cases appealed to the civil courts. How many have been overturned? Zero. 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 It's because I am very smart and exceptionally talented and I'm never wrong. Didn't you know that? Now, my children will tell you that's ridiculous. My wife would be here no. laughing over that phenomenon. But I've won every single one of my cases that have been appealed to the secular courts. Not because I'm very smart, and not because I know Jewish law so well, but because the standard of review is so low. I'm breathing, and I write good opinions, I get affirmed. It doesn't matter what I say, so long as I obey these minimal procedural due process things. What are minimal procedural due process things? I do not hit the litigants. I do not take a bribe. I don't speak terribly out of turn. I don't hear hearings at 3 in the morning. I don't otherwise engage in terrible misconduct. But how I resolve matters, the, judge has, the secular judge who's reviewing my decision, he has no way to determine whether I'm getting the Jewish law correct or not. Now, of course, my jurisdiction is more limited than in a civil court because I can only adjudicate financial matters and in some states child custody. So I can't throw you in jail, um, but I have a lot of authority if I can control the money, including the authority to say to you, if you don't do as I want you to do on another matter, it will be very expensive. And I'm not subject to the same limitations as civil, a civil court judge is, which is a civil court judge can't say either you apologize or pay an excessive fine. Whereas I can say, here's the deal, you either apologize of your own free will or you hand over a million dollars. I've discovered here in cases that when I say either apologize or hand over a million dollars, you know what people do? They sincerely apologize. <laughs> they not just apologize, they sincerely apologize. Um, and lots of other things occur. And by the way, things occur in Bacon that the civil court judges know are illegal. Not just the underlining activity, I've adjudicated polygamous marriages. Let me give you a sort of a standard American law case that I've sat on a few times what they call a heter meyer rabbanim in Hebrew, which is a man and a woman are married, and they are both 55. I'll pick the last case I did, and she starts to suffer from premature Alzheimer's and is in a mental institution having lost her mind. It's very sad. The man comes to Bacon, and what does he want? Permission to remarry. 
but he doesn't want to divorce her, and he's not prepared to file for a civil divorce. Why doesn't he want to file for a civil divorce? His insurance covers her. Because if he files for civil divorce, she will lose his health insurance, and she needs his health insurance to cover her care in the place she's staying. So he wants an adjudication from the Beitin as to what will be the financial arrangements with his second wife, who he will marry religiously, but not civilly. The state will not recognize the second marriage as valid, um, but we will, and we will make him sign a marriage contract with his second wife that adjudicates the finances of their halachic marriage in a way that's civilly binding, um, even though he's still married to his first wife. I know fully well that this is an out-and-out -out violation of the bigamy laws in some states, but what? I don't care. And the civil court will uphold that contract? And the civil court will uphold that contract. Let me explain to you why. We won't allow the civil court to adjudicate that contract, because at the end of that contract, what will we put in as a final clause? Should there be a matter in dispute in this contract, this contract will be adjudicated in? Arbitration. Arbitration. Right, but which arbitration? Let's say they don't agree which arbitration. No, no, no. We say arbitration in front of <coughs> the Bethlehem of America. Well, that's it. Close down. Arbitration in front of their successor organizations. Arbitration in front yeah. of? It's foolproof. Uh, you can write it in a way that it's foolproof. It's not, you know, when you say, well, what happens when there's a nuclear war and New York City is destroyed? So I'm, we don't worry about sort of far-fetched things, but my arbitration agreements say an arbitration panel selected by Michael Broy, and if for some other reason Michael Broy cannot select the arbitrator or does not do so within 30 days, then the arbitrator shall be selected by... Um, the president of Yeshiva University. Okay, is it possible that there'll be a time when there is no president of Yeshiva University? I guess so, but <coughs> but it's so f it it becomes so far fetched to imagine sort of uh, the list of contingencies that would be required. Please, you wanted to ask. Oh me. yeah, I just wanted to um, with, with Ford, I just wanted to ask with um, financial matters. If you if you say let's say, pay a fine, can you go to the civil court if the person doesn't pay the fine? And of course, if they don't pay the fine, we the other side goes to court and they don't have a review of whether the fine is owed or not. All they get is a sheriff's enforcement order, which is the debt is already acknowledged. The sheriff comes and does what? <coughs> Takes the money from you. There's no substantive review of whether the arbitration financial order is proper or not. No such thing. Um, all it is is it's a pure enforcement matter. What happens in the United States is church and state stay totally distinct. Um, the arbitration tribunals pay no attention to what the secular courts are doing. The secular courts pay no attention to what the religious courts are doing, they do not substantively look at them, and they say as follows, you agreed to go to this court, you know what you'll do? You'll get what you deserve. Now of course, if you lack some common sense, you'll overstep your boundaries. About 10 years ago there was an Islamic law case in New Jersey in which the Islamic court ordered a man to rape his wife's sister in retaliation for marital misconduct. Now that was not enforced. Okay? Uh, that would never dawn on a Bacon to do. So you got to learn there are things that you can't do. But if you do things that focus on money, um, then things work out just fine, and the secular courts pay no attention to anything that you do. Please. Um, drugs, tax evasion, prostitution, these are, these are all money. You can do any of anything you want and you'll never have any kind of um, accountability towards secular courts. So long as um, you stay away from an order that doesn't focus on money, 
you'll never have a problem. Meaning, you and I are in the business of stealing cars. Okay? I steal them, you sell them. Okay? And you refuse to give me the money that you owe me for the tens cars that I sold. We agree to go to Bacon in front of Yael, who's sitting over there. And Yael decides that you will give me $18,000. And she writes out an order which says, you will give me $18,000. That is fully enforceable. She cannot, of course, give an order which says, you shall return the cars that I stole to me. And of course, if I'm bringing in heroin and you're selling it, she cannot give an order which says, you shall return the heroin to me. Um, because courts will not enforce an order with a sheriff. The sheriff will take the heroin from you and give it to me, because he will not do that. But they will enforce an order from the sheriff in which Yael says, you will give me $18,000, and right. why you owe me $18,000 isn't even noted in the order. No, but let's say it is noted in the order. So then you get what you deserve. Then you're being foolish. Of course, if you note in the order... No, the courts do care, meaning that then it's not, this is not ex No, but they're prepared to enforce an order with no reason. Okay. Once you say to me, uh, the judge says all the time, do not give me your reasons or anything else. Give me an order that's simple to understand. I write orders all the time. The orders say A shall pay B blank amount of money or do B, C, D, A, F, and G. Right, but let's say somebody would want to use the baked-in protocol or the baked-in reasons that you give as evidence in a in another civil case, that would be okay, that would be admissible. But there's no record. All you get is an order. What do you mean? I get a protocol of the, of the hearing, I guess. Um, generally, they're governed by an order, very tight privacy the concerns. There's arbitrator's privilege. I won't hand over the tape. I won't hand over the tape. The tape is not a public record. It's totally not like what you have here. There's no court reporter. I mean, you get a psak din. Right. You don't have reasons on your psak din. No. Nope. Want to know why? Yeah. You tell me why. Because you're afraid of scrutiny, but that's not a good reason. It's an excellent reason, because the scrutiny comes from the secular court judges. No, but they're not going to scrutinize you on substance. You don't give any reasons, you give orders. You give orders. Like I learned from the Court of Appeals judge that I clerked for. When he wanted something done, he didn't write an opinion, he gave an order. Yeah, but you want people... I mean, there's even, no even, in halacha, even in halacha, there's a demand to give reasons in some cases. Sure. So internally, in the Beth Din of America, which has an internal appeal process, there's an internal opinion. But frequently, the secular court judge doesn't see the internal opinion. The secular yeah. court judge only sees the order. It says A owes B blank. Yeah, but once <laughs> there is a, a, you know, a detailed reasoning, then who knows where it can get. No! It's an, it's an appealable, it's an arbitrator's privileged document. That's exactly the point. These are private hearings. They're not public hearings. They're private hearings. We're not courts of the state. We're private arbitration tribunals. When does the state get access to these private hearings? Only when you confess to a future crime. Not a past crime. Past crime, the state won't even bother trying. If you say something in an R, in a bait and hearing, it's a privacy uh, law. That, it's, a, that, it's a privilege. It's it's called arbitrator's yeah. privilege. When you say something like tomorrow I'm going to kill Joe, the bait and would report you and would hand over that transcript. But when you discuss the car theft business that we're in, the state doesn't get access to that. You're talking about totally private arbitration tribunals that are immune from judicial scrutiny through and through. Of course, now you understand that what we have here is something totally different than what you have in Israel. What you have in no, Israel... I'm thinking of our private basin. We have plenty of private... Right, but even Israel. the private but but like in are more public. Yeah, much more public. They're, public. they're subject to much more <clears throat> review. You have no truly private rabbinical courts in commercial matters. None, and none in family law matters either. The public rabbinical courts, the state courts, are um, courts of the state, subject to everything, not just full review and mm -hmm. hearings, but subject to appeal, subject to judicial review, and essentially subject to the Knesset. Many times, as you all know, 
the Knesset has passed legislation directing the rabbinical courts to do something. And although they resist, ultimately they have no choice but to comply because they're courts of the state. And as courts of the state, you're hard pressed to resist. Um, so what you have here are two totally and completely different systems. They don't look alike at all. Um, what's happening in the United States is, is this is not, by the way, a Jewish phenomenon, and the state <coughs> did not enact these rules for the benefit of the rabbinical courts. There's a thriving network of Christian arbitration tribunals called peacemakers. That's what they're called. They have a much nicer term than the rabbinical courts. We call ourselves but they did, houses of law, and the Christians call their network um, peacemakers. That's that. Would you rather go to a house of law or a peacemaker? A house of law, anything. Okay, I got it. Um, and there's a, there are fewer Islamic tribunals, and there are quite a few canon law courts, although they don't always do the same thing. And there are thousands of Protestant informal networks in the United States that adjudicate disputes in the Protestant community. What's happening in the United States is the evangelical community lost control of secular law. Starting with the gay rights decision, it became clear that secular law was for the first time going to be secular. And the evangelical community is slowly withdrawing from aspects of secular family law and sending them to private arbitration tribunals. And it's not just the Jewish courts that are doing this. Um, ‫אז <laughs> 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 of course because it's all, I want to note as follows the Beit Din Haggadol has no choice because what are they? they work for the state I think that the halacha no 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 okay now I'll give you an honest answer we adjudicate honest, honest answer we feel that we adjudicate disputes between people two, two when the halacha directs that two people are entitled to adjudication in halacha we would adjudicate disputes between ganavim Sometimes we direct that things get returned to their true owner, but not always. I steal cars, I give them to him, he sells the cars, and now he has money. We have a Din Torah, Al P. Din, the Beit Din is supposed to adjudicate our dispute about money. If you didn't work for the state, you would do it also. It's exactly because you're stuck working for a state. Yeah, but the separation is also problematic because if there would be a, a real basin system that the basin would also be able to preside over criminal cases, then you deal with the criminal issue also. And the separation raises very I understand, but I'm just, I want to respond to you very directly. <laughs> זה טוב לעשות, because I have two people who have a fight about money. We should resolve their dispute. If they still have the stolen item in front of them, we direct that it be returned to the third, to the 
to oh, me, yeah. to, the um, to the person who it was stolen from. But if the item that's stolen is gone, um, then um, we adjudicate the money, and that's called Shinui Rishut. And once Shinui Rishut had gone of Kona, so which of them is Kona? That's a Shiloh. Um, so it's a very, very, very different system. E even the private rabbinical courts here are subject to much greater discussion. Um, what you have here, though, which is different, totally different, is um, people have to opt in. People have to choose to go to Baton. And it's sort of very fascinating to watch who chooses and who doesn't choose and what are the virtues and what are the vices. Um, in family law matters, everybody opts in. And they opt in before they get married by signing a prenuptial agreement. And the reason why they sign the prenuptial agreement is because we like enforcing family values. It, by the way, is very complicated. The state of New York does not consider adultery to be fault in the end of a marriage. Do you want to be in a marriage where adultery is not fault? That's an interesting question. Um, so many people opt to go to Bate Din because they like Jewish family values. It, it rewards the innocent spouse. Um, the secular law in the United States in 39 of the 50 states does not reward the innocent spouse. Only 11 states consider marital misconduct to be a factor in the equitable division of assets. So two people are married and one of them engages in marital misconduct. Um, 39 states say we don't care. Um, and if you're in one of those states, you might very well sign a prenup which says I do care. And if you, my spouse, say you don't care, then you know what? I don't want to marry you. Because I get it. You say to me you want to commit adultery without punishment, maybe we don't want to get married. Do the Haredim sign prenups? They don't sign the same one the moderns do, but they sign prenups in various forms. Only what we call in America um, the hard Hasidim don't. Meaning what you would call in Israel the Haredim do. I, you know, sort of, in Israel there's, there's two communities to the left, of, to the right of the moderns. There's um, the Haredim and the Hasidim. In America what we would call the Haredim do sign, the Hasidim do not sign. There's a different reason, by the way. The Hasidim do not sign because they still are comfortable violating the secular law and using um, physical force. Neither the Haredim nor the moderns are prepared to beat people up. But no, they did until a few years ago. No. Um, what Mendel Epstein was doing was purely within the Hasidic community. Um, if you stepped into the Chaim Berlin community, the Lakewood community, mm -hmm. there was almost no violence. Mm -hmm. The violence was exclusively in Bell's and pop of and places like this, um, where there was still an element of a, a baked in pop of would order kofin aliget and kofin chadmash, kofin right? And kofin meant they hit you. And when you said, but no kofin, you can't hit me. That violates American law. That's an interesting thing to say while they're holding your head underwater. Um, it's sort of it's hard to hear you because your head is underwater. Um, um, but in neither the modern community nor the what we call in America the Litvish Haredi community is anybody prepared to use. So in Lakewood they sign prenups? Yes, they don't sign the prenup that's under the auspices of the Beth. In America they sign a simpler prenup. They sign the prenup that Rav Moshe endorses in his letter to Rav, Rav Pearl, which says, We agree to listen to whatever the Beit Din says. We have a more complicated prenup because, don't you know, we are sophisticated. <laughs> Um, but they have a much simpler prenup, but it's a prenup that gives you enough authority that when the Beitin wants to hurt you financially, they hurt you financially. Um, so this is a picture of the way things run. Okay. 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 Um, 
And so I think that, that this is the underlying issue as to how things run in the states. Um, it's a different system. Um, I'm in the process of writing a book on why this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's overall a defense <laughs> of... Okay. <laughs> I, so I, I, I think that... He's trying to convince you. I think that, that, um, that the, the central question, which I didn't address, which I'll sort of talk about for five minutes, is, is it a wise idea for a Western democracy to permit this? That's, of course, uh, not a Jewish law issue at all. Uh, Work. According to what you said, a sheriff can enforce an arbitration tribunal of the mafia. Um, it, it's, it's funny. It could happen. It could happen. That's right. Um, not a physical one, but a financial one. And thieves uh, use the mafia American... Mafia is all about money. <clears throat> By the way, the American Arbitration Association, more than half their cases involve thievery. This is not a Jewish phenomenon. It's not that Jews go to bait them. But isn't it strange that the state enforces such cases? No, because I'll tell you what the rationale is. No, but I want to explain to you why. There's an elaborate rationale for why secular law does this. This is the heart of why this is a good. Secular law recognizes that allowing arbitration of financial matters in these kinds of situations is better than the self-help remedies that will otherwise result. Okay, and this is very important to understand. You raised an excellent question, but if you don't allow the American arbitration to adjudicate these disputes, how do people resolve their disputes when the underlying issue is a crime? They kill each other. They kill each other. They beat each other up. So this has nothing to do with Judaism. Meaning the Federal Arbitration Act was acutely aware of this and wanted to encourage these matters into arbitration <laughs> so as to avoid violence in the streets. So I just want to share that with you as a, you raised the right question. Secular law in the United States encourages these contractual remedies. There is a counter-revolution out there. There's a lot of literature about whether or not a Western democracy really should encourage um, this kind of law. Particularly in Europe, where there's one law for the whole country, there's a strong push which says one law for everybody. Already France does not allow these arbitrations functionally. But in the United States, the argument that's always carried today is we're a federalized system. You and I have a dispute and we agree that the law that will hear our, our matter will be Alabama law or Alaska law or Arkansas law, just to pick the A's. That's fine. So what difference does it make if instead of agreeing to Alabama law or Arkansas law or, um, or Alaska law, we agree to Jewish law? One answer is that in a federalized system, things are federalized and Jewish law can be part of the federal system. The other is it's an aspect of religious liberty to let people contractually agree to be governed by religious law. Another answer is Religious courts can do things that are social goods, like order the giving of a get, which otherwise the secular courts prove powerless over. And another answer is, is that um, religious tribunals do a better job of adjudicating co-religionist commerce, which is they're better experts at resolving matters like, is this food kosher? Otherwise, the secular courts struggle mightily to resolve disputes between a kosher food vendor and a kosher food supplier as to whether the food is really kosher. It's true, they can resolve it, but they never get it right. They never get it right. When you and I sign a contract in which you agree to build me an a roof, and I refuse to pay you because I say the a roof is not kosher, a, a judge can learn Hilchot a in and then resolve this dispute. But what? That is not fun. That is not fun. It's easier done by a rabbinical court than by a secular judge. Yeah, but that's true for you know, myriad cases that come to secular courts about, I don't know, different wounds and injuries, medical issues. Sure. You bring in an expert and that's so, but, agreed upon with us. Uh, but in fact, what happens in the United <laughs> States is anybody who can send these to expert arbitration does so. This is why the American Arbitration Association exists. The American Arbitration Association is larger than all but four or five states. 
It hears thousands and thousands of disputes precisely because they provide expert adjudication that people like. Expert adjudication has great advantages. It's faster, it's cheaper, studies show it's more accurate. Presumably, rabbinical court arbitration in matters that Diana know is also faster, cheaper, and more accurate. Are you members of the American Arbitration System? I am. The RCA is member? Some are, some aren't, some Diana are. But you learn to become an expert at what you're doing. You certainly take AAA um, training because you've got to get good at what you're doing if you want to do it all the time. So that's it for what I wanted to say. I've sort of shared with you what I know, and you can contrast it with the rabbinical courts, which I sort of only know a little bit. Please. I have a question. I don't understand how you can actually isolate uh, <clears throat> Sides into the inner sphere of justice. Let's say A and, a and B go to a rabbinical arbitrator. One of them goes to insolvency. Oh. He goes to bankruptcy. Ah. And then there comes a, a trustee. You, you, need, you need to. You're 100% correct. There are multi party disputes that Bate Din customarily don't resolve. Bankruptcy is one of them. Indeed, just recently, a bankruptcy court in New York enjoined a rabbinical court against hearing a matter because you can't resolve the dispute between A and B without affecting the rights of C. A hundred percent. There are cases where you can't resolve the matter because some of the parties are not in front of the rabbinical court. But that's no different than arbitration in general. Sometimes, if all the parties won't sign arbitration, then it ends up in secular court, 100%. The Derek Chal loathes him in your name, Pshitat Regal, but but they didn't. No, let's say, and we go to an arbitrator. No one is uh, no one is in insolvency. Right. Both of them, they're okay. Right. Two years ago, one of them goes to insolvency. Right, so the federal bankruptcy code has a look-back provision of nine, 180 days. Okay. So there's a look-back provision. Within 180 days, they can void the PSOC. But that's no different, by the way, than if you and I do a business deal and I give you money. And three years later, I file for insolvency. And they go to you and say, you got what they called an unjust enrichment or you got a, an act of favoritism. Sure, that happens. Bankruptcy courts sometimes claw back for people who get unjust money. So, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, all of this actually happens. When you run a private rabbinical court, you have a totally different system with totally different parameters. I'm hoping to hear from uh, the judge first. I don't want to cut too much time. So, 